But he undoubtedly, I mean, if you're talking about playing, Pete Rose undoubtedly should be enshrined along the likes of Ty Cobb, Jackie Robinson, Lou Gehrig, Babe all, Ruth. All notorious assholes. Mike Piazza. Um. Scott Rowland. <laughs> really, people? The Reese Company. By the way, like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> it helps the algorithm. <laughs> the Reese Company. All right, crack open a tepid Genesee and watch the pictures as they travel through your neighbor's Wi-Fi. It's the Rees Company. I'm Steve Rees, the bull of American broadcasting, alongside the great Chris Morganti. How are you, Chris? I'm good, Steve. All right, so uh, shall we go into our movie of the week of the week? Yes, let's do that. Okay. All right, our movie of the week of the week this week is called Hustle. It aired on September 25th, 2004 on ESPN. Mm -hmm. And it focuses on the troubled late career of baseball legend Pete Rose. It's directed by Peter Bogdanovich. Okay. Well-known guy, part of the new Hollywood of the late 60s and early 70s. Oh, okay. Best known for his cinematic releases. I guess um, The Last Picture Show is his most notable film. But he's also known for always wearing a stupid neckerchief like he's about to run with the bulls. Mm. And um, he helmed, surprisingly, a large number of um, made-for-TV films. And this was his seventh and last. He died in 2022. Oh, okay. Top build is Tom Sizemore, an actor who, as we record this, is recently deceased. Yeah. In Hustle, he plays Pete Rose, a.k.a. Charlie Hustle. Um, the film takes place in the mid to late 80s when Rose made some famous and unfortunate decisions. Let's check out an early scene where Pete sells a car to the owner of a gym where he's a regular. 75K. Hey, why the blind man stop skydiving? It was scaring the hell out of his dog. <laughs> now nah, you want a piece of history that's the car i drove to the ballpark tonight i not cop out of the record books don't need it no more i got the corvette <laughs> hey saturday my place game three be there you too stretch you're in yeah i misspoke earlier chris when i said tom sizemore plays pete rose i meant he plays al pacino playing pete rose yeah it's very reminiscent of an al pacino uh performance and not at all like pete rose um well i don't i don't i don't know that i knew much of pete rose outside of seeing him on a ball field so i don't you know well if you're interested in more you've come to the wrong place okay if you're interested in any kind of uh, lifelike recreation of Pete Rose's personality or uh, demeanor, yeah, I'm not sure this is the film for you to see. Um, but well, that's we, a- we do see the real Pete Rose in the beginning. Yeah, there's a there's a for some reason three minutes of baseball footage while the opening credits play, um, which I think it, most of that was him, and some of it may have been Tom Sizemore. I don't know. Yeah, I, I believe uh, most of it was him. I, I skipped yeah. past it because I knew we couldn't play it because Glory Days by Bruce Springsteen was uh, yeah. Yeah. Running behind it. <clears throat> but uh, we also see him at, at the very end. Yeah. Yeah. The real Pete Rose. Yeah. Now, we're not going to see him at the end. Right. Um, <clears throat> Hustle is really the story. And it, this is why it's okay that Tom Sizemore made some unfortunate choices of his own. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's really the story of Polly Jansen. And he was a friend of a friend who becomes Pete Rose's right-hand man. He's the guy he just called Stretch yeah, in that yeah. last scene. Yeah. And he's played by Dash Mihawk. Here we see the first time the two have a chance to uh, chat on their own. Hey. My 44 game hitting streak. And here's my dad. Wow. That's your father. Yeah. 
They call them old swivel hips. <laughs> Back in 1952, when I was 11, the old man was 40 years old. He kicked off, he ran downfield, and he got nailed with a great block, fractured his hip. But Harry Rose crawled after the ball carrier, made a tackle. The kind of guy he was. The kind of guy he made me into. So what do you do, Paul, when you're not working out, huh? I used to work out at the Queen City Barrel Company. You know, if I hadn't made it as a ball player, I'd ended up digging ditches. Don't be ashamed for an honest living. Well, Paulie's got a couple of nice, not so honest sidelines, too, don't you, Paulie? Looks like he's smart enough not to use his own product, unlike you. Yeah. Now, that sideline that man's referring to is Paulie's trade as a steroid dealer. Yeah. And that's the sideline the third man is referring to. Paulie, Pete, and friends. They gather at the track to bet on horses, and they win big. And it's not long before Pete invites Paulie to tag along with him to an autograph signing on the West Coast. Afterward, Pete recounts how he met his wife. Actually, now that I think of it, I'm not sure it was on the West Coast. I think the West Coast thing comes later. I don't know. This is not it. But uh, let's, let's hear Pete's reminiscence. First time I saw Carol, she was at a restaurant. She was serving cocktails in, uh, you know, one of those... Mini skirts? She had the nicest bottom I ever saw. She seems really sweet. Thanks. Behind every successful man is a, a great woman, right? Uh, well, I better be going. I got a, a good woman waiting for me, too. Thanks, Pete. For everything. I, today was one of the best days of my life. Really? Yeah. Oh, no. You earned it. My bodyguard. We're going to make a great team. You and me. Yeah, now, Paulie is serving as Pete's bodyguard. Kind of unofficially, but that's the role he's playing. Uh, the real-life Paulie did indeed use his own steroids. Yeah. Yeah, the, the other guy who Pete Rose accused of being high on his own supply... He he. Uh, we we see a scene where he does a couple bumps of coke and then immediately injects himself with steroids. So uh, he's got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. But, but he's he's the guy who in the beginning is placing bets for for Pete Rose. But I guess we'll we'll get to that. Right. Um. <clears throat> so Paulie and Pete they become fast friends, and here we see the two taking in the sights of the racetrack. Okay. You know, I never even placed a bet before we met. Really? Yeah. How did you manage that? It just never occurred to me. I don't think it's never not occurred to me. <laughs> it's like when you feel that solid crack and you know you got a stand-up double. You're on a first base. You're watching that outfielder. Now it's all a matter of odds. What are the chances he's going to make a perfect throw? You head for third base. Is he even thinking third? That's the gamble. Can you stretch a stand-up double into a triple? Can you beat the odds? It takes a special kind of person to have that kind of confidence. Now, you just have to be willing to be thrown out. Yeah. <clears throat> now, a speech like that uh, makes me think, and I'm sure this discussion never took place, but it makes me think that if Pete had applied his gambling brain to baseball strategy, he could have invented sabermetrics. Uh, well, is it the scene where he says, like, I think right after that he says like uh, I just that's how I live my life I go all in or is that is that a different scene? I believe that's a different scene. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> it might be this one though. Well, the scene continues and another man appears. Pete introduces him as Ronnie. Ronnie is brusque, curt, and short on patience. But with Pete's encouragement, Paulie goes for a stroll with Ronnie. You been a friend of Pete's long? No, not really that long, but. We pretty much grew up in the same area, so it's kind of like we go back. What's that mean, kind of like? Uh, Why so nervous, Paul? What, am I terrifying? Pause. I'm just not rude. No, you're just rude. And I don't have to answer these questions. Who are you? <laughs> All right, continue. I'm really sure what we're talking about. I'm a cautious man. I believe in looking both ways before I cross the street. You a gambling man, Paul? Now and then. Pete's a gambling man, has a real passion for it. 
Which, for a guy in his position, is not necessarily a good thing. That's where you would come in. A little lost. You're gonna phone Pete's picks into me. I'm gonna then relay that action to New York. You see how it works now? Everyone's clean once removed. I, I think I should talk to Pete about... Pete already talked to me about it. Now I'm talking to you. You can't handle the way? We'll find someone who can. Yeah. He's a mafia guy. Um, I wouldn't say that. When he refers to the people in New York, he's referring to mafia guys. Right. This guy, Ronnie, is a restaurant owner in Ohio. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Um, Paulie agrees to be the middleman, and, uh, and we have a picture of this. At different points, ja uh, Dash Mihuk, the guy playing Paulie, reminds me of three people. And uh, we're gonna take a, we're gonna take a look, and you can make the comparison on your own and see if I'm right. We have um, a variety of different folks. See, we we have Dash on the top left. Next to him is someone he could convincingly play, alleged comedian Jamie Kennedy. Okay. Bottom right, former Metallica bassist Jason Newstead. Sure. And, of course, The Undertaker. Okay. That, that last one is The Undertaker? Uh, well, it, it depends. Which one do you consider the last? <laughs> <clears throat> the bottom right. Bottom right is Jason Newstead from Metallica. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're going, uh, you're going clockwise. I you described, me there. I described gotcha. the setting of each one except The Undertaker because he was the one I had not yet mentioned. Well, the one, can we put that back up? The one on the top left-hand corner. Yeah. Uh, that kind of looks like Prince Harry. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so he could play him as well. <laughs> yeah. He seems to be very versatile. Yeah. So it stands to reason that his IMDb credits are uh, vast and varied. Okay. So uh, Paulie, he becomes a, a continuous presence in the Reds' clubhouse. And assistant coach Tommy Helms takes notice of this. NBA. Hey, Pete. Hey. Can I have a second? Got a kid needs some help in the infield. Give us a minute, will you, Tommy? Tommy. You deal with it. So I hired you. You're the best. Only the best. Okay. All right. Hey, Doug. Hi. Yeah. We'll see more of this later, but this scene and others suggest that Pete had a way of manipulating people by making them feel good about themselves. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, yeah. Is that manipulating people or uh, that reminds you of like a Dale Carnegie type of thing? I don't know. <laughs> Well, is there any difference, really? Yeah, yeah. It's all just manipulating people to get what you want. Yeah. And uh, he seemed to be a master at that. And uh, at the end of that scene, we saw an executive uh, enter to warn Pete that non-baseball personnel are not allowed in the clubhouse. Is this Marge Schott? She's, she is next indeed. All right. That, uh, that uh, discussion with the executive results in a dinner with and a talking to from Red's owner, Marge Schott. Commissioner's a stickler for the non-baseball personnel rule. You I just know didn't that. Really appreciate being legend like a school you know, kid. Yeah, well, Doug has a job to do, and I'm the one who pays him to do it. I'll stick by the rules. Why I don't pay him to look the other problem. way. Hey. We have a good team this year. Larry a lot Mars of talent. Will get you everywhere. But outside <laughs> distractions, we don't need. Now, just tell me one thing. Rose isn't short for anything, is it? Like Rosen, Rosenberg, Rosenblatt. You know. <clears throat> Yeah, Marge, Marge was not a tolerant person. Look yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah, in fact, the rest of that scene, they, uh, they discussed the problems in East Cincinnati, which uh, <laughs> you know, we, we can't show that. <laughs> <coughs> so Paulie, he keeps his distance from uh, the clubhouse for a while, but the operation continues. Paul, Paulie calls in Pete's bets. See, I knew I was going to almost say Pete best. <laughs> Paulie calls in Pete's bets. That's very hard to say. Is it? If you have a beetle brain, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Pete's wagers are called in by Paulie. And um, <clears throat> one night, Paulie receives a call of his own, and Dash Mehuck makes an acting choice that always irritates me. Oh, boy. Hello. Ron? You're responsible, not the other guy. I break your freaking legs. No one will give a shit. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? I didn't I didn't pick up on it. Okay. You've seen it a million times. 
A character gets a phone call in the middle of the night. Sure. And to illustrate interrupted sleep, he breathes heavily out his nose. Does anyone do this outside the presence of a film crew? You want me to demonstrate if you missed it? Okay. Okay, let's pretend the phone's ringing here. It's the middle of the night. I'm sleeping. Oh, man, I'm so, so tired. I'm dreaming. Phone rings. Hello? Now, when I'm awakened, I may have to cough for an hour or two. Yeah. But I don't start breathing backwards. <laughs> Unbelievable. Anyway, that call was from Ronnie, the horrible man from the racetrack. Pete has hit a losing streak and has not made good on his gambling debts. Paulie is threatened with bodily harm since he's technically the one doing all this gambling, and no one is going to harm a high-profile athlete. Pete cuts Paulie a check to hold Ronnie off for a while, but not for the full amount owed, and Paulie is surprised that Pete wants to gamble large amounts on the games that evening. Pete explains. Hey. And uh, you get down to the Lakers, too. That one's a lock. They're all a lock until the game's over. Oh, Paul, come on. You know I can't watch a game unless I got something riding on it. I ain't got no hobbies. It's sports. When I was a boy, before I went to bed, my old man made me take a hundred swings from the left, a hundred from the right. You know why? Because he knew if I didn't make it in baseball, I wasn't going nowhere. And that's the way it's always been. It's all or nothing. Get him tonight, Pete. Okay. That's the scene you were talking about. Yeah, I and mean, that's either a character-defining moment or more manipulation. You know, yeah, you decide. I, I believe it's character-defining. Yeah. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Yeah, continue on. Okay, but it, it does explain um, Pete's drive. Yeah. To gamble and, and also to win baseball games. I mean, everything he does, he's all or nothing. Yeah, and I, I didn't. I mean, I never read. It was the the Dowd report? Yeah, yeah, that was the the paper that baseball eventually commissioned to uncover what the sh- the hijinks that uh, Pete was up to. But I did. I never read it, so I didn't realize until I watched this that it wasn't just that he was gambling. He was stiffing. He was having other people place his bets and then stiffing him. Yeah, because, because he wasn't paying them. And I guess I guess the whole thing was he was only what I'm led to believe by watching this was. He didn't want to touch the money he was making in baseball. He only wanted to use the cash that he was drawing in from selling autographed baseballs and autographed jerseys and stuff. So he was keeping it all cash. So he didn't have, like, he couldn't just go and take $30,000 out of his bank account because then the IRS would be like, well, well where'd that money go? Hmm. Or, or something like that. I don't know. But I didn't realize he was stiffing these people. If he'd just been a better guy, then maybe he wouldn't have had all these problems. Mm, right. What, how, about, how about get a guy who's not also a drug dealer to place your bets? Because that seems to be what undoes him in the end, but I, I don't know. Okay, well, uh, Pauly meets with Ronnie to give him the check. The, the check Pete just cut to uh, kind of hold Ronnie off for a little bit. Yeah. And the people from New York, as they're called here. And Ronnie has <laughs> some advice. They're different from the... <laughs> Never mind. The people from Chicago? Yes. Oh, yes okay. I, I, I believe so. Uh, <clears throat> Ronnie has some advice that could turn Pete's fortunes around. Your boss should only bet on things he knows. Huh? I say something, you say, huh, what are you, deaf? You want Pete to bet on baseball? You don't manage a hockey team, Einstein. What can I get you? Coffee black. Okay. (laughs) We'll have the rest next week. You know, Pete won't cross that line. That's something he'd never do. He'd bet on his own sport. You're so dumb, you shouldn't be allowed to breathe. <laughs> yeah, unnecessarily rude. Yeah, but he does come across as really dumb in the whole movie. Right, right. And also, this didn't, didn't happen because Pete was already betting on baseball. Mm. So, uh, struggling to recoup from his losses, Pete, as portrayed here, now stands on a moral precipice.
Yeah. Now, Chris, in case you're confused, in that scene, Pete Rose was the guy behind the manager's desk at the Cincinnati Reds clubhouse in the Reds jacket. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, and he was trying to decide whether to bet on the Red Sox or the Reds, apparently. Because he already had red written down. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, potentially. <coughs> so here. <coughs> um, forgive me. So here, fictional Pete bets, bets on baseball for the first time. And he even bets on the game he's about to manage. But picks the Reds to win. But it's not enough to make him solvent. And days later, Pete gets a call from Ronnie. And he makes an excuse that's inconvenient for Polly. Oh, oh, look, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong here. It's Polly. Yeah, Jansen. Yeah, he's been placing all kinds of crazy bets all over town and laying them off on me. It's like he's got a screw loose or something. Oh, no, I wouldn't mess with him. He's like 110% crazy, believe me. I seen him almost kill a guy once. Yeah. Okay, hold on. Do you know what you just did? The, the position you just put me in? He's scared shit. That's what he's worried about. Jeez, Pete, that guy's connected. He's like in the mafia or something. Mafia. Oh, this movie crap. These, these bums are a bunch of pansies. No. I've seen the look in Ronnie's eye. You know, he means business. What are you, a pussy? You a big pussy, Polly? All show and no go? Hmm? Pete, why are you talking to me like that? I've been dealing with scum like Ron Delaplane my whole life. All right? It's his job to threaten me. You know, say he'll cut me off. But the thing is, what are these jerks going to do without guys like me? I'm the bread and butter. I'm the reason he's in business, see? He's going to get his money. I just want to make him sweat and make him remember who's the boss. See? Well, why don't you just mention Tony Danza? Maybe hum the theme song? (laughs) Why drag me into it? Uh, He he said uh, he's been dying of the same heart attack for 40 years. That's a Pacino line. Oh, 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 okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. (laughs) Hoo-ah! <laughs> I probably should have done that instead. So, uh, Paulie starts to dip into his life savings to, covers Pete, to cover Pete's losses. And yeah. uh, he and his... Uh, his, girl, uh, his life savings of uh, steroid selling. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, he also believes he'll be repaid when Pete's fortunes rebound. But after conferring with other Rose associates who have had similar dealings, Paulie starts to believe that he'll never see his money. Yeah. He visits Pete with the intention of telling him he can no longer place his bets. Let's see how this goes. I, I, I can't handle it. The pressure of... Look, nothing bothers you. You know, I, I'm not like that. Oh, yeah? So we're not buddies anymore? Is that it? No. No, of course not. Pete, you know, I, I'd do anything for you. I, I'd go to the wall. I just... I need to get away from... I need to get away from the other stuff, you know? The, the bedding. It's got me like I, I, I can't think straight. Got you something. I don't want it now. Look at the back. Holly, my number one fan and friend, P. Rose. Take it back if you want and get something else. The jeweler I got it from, he's a friend of mine. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade it for my life. That's a very poignant scene, Steve. Agreed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it reminded me of when, uh, you know, you first approached me about wanting to do this podcast together. And uh, you also bought me this, this wonderful wristwatch. Uh, and, and it really, you know, it really made me think and, uh, you know, Maybe you want to do the show. And then you had it also nicely inscribed on the back, like, uh, oh, that's not what I remember it saying, though. Is this is this the same watch? Uh, I believe so. You're no Eric Todd? Oh, well. I don't know what that means. <laughs> well, I'm sure some people do, and they'll enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, um, also, can we see that fo- that photograph again? The, the collage of the four uh, folks. Uh, what we had is we had... Um, these are people that I thought uh, Dash um, Mehuk could yeah. also play alongside sure. an image of Dash Mehuk because I thought he'd be effective in these Now, he's roles. the one in the top left. He's the one in the top left. And it, what just occurred to me is, Chris, you saw this photo, and you said to me, the guy in the bottom right is The Undertaker? Right, because I didn't realize you were going clockwise. I thought you were going as you would read a book. Do you need directions to identify The Undertaker? 
I, I, you assume I can see the TV from here, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of us is wearing glasses. So. <sighs> Plus, you know I'm not a wrestling fan. The Undertaker could walk in here right now. Can, yeah, carrying his base. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Th- that he's known to carry. That's why I thought it was Part odd. of the profession of the Undertaker. <laughs> that's why I thought it was odd. <laughs> you shouldn't have thought it was. <laughs> uh. All right. <clears throat> so the watch only goes so far with Polly. Yeah. Pete blames, uh, uh, Pete's wife blames Polly for all of their financial and marital difficulties, and Pete cuts Polly loose. Won't take his calls. Now, to stay afloat, Paulie doubles down on dealing steroids, which puts him on the government's radar. He's arrested for distribution, and uh, his girlfriend, I think still his girlfriend at the time, uses the last of their savings and perhaps even borrowed from her grandmother or something like that. I don't know. Uses the last of the money available to the family to bail Paulie out. Now, there's a disclaimer in the beginning that some elements have been fictionalized. Now, I'm guessing one of those elements is Pete visiting a stylist to get a haircut. <laughs> because that's where Paulie tracks down Pete and tells him of the spot he's in. <laughs> and Pete takes him for a drive and tells Paulie he'll arrange a meeting for him with his personal attorney. Now, we can't show you that scene because the whole time Cover Me by Bruce Springsteen plays on the car stereo. Why is it all these Bruce Springsteen songs? There were a couple of Springsteen songs. There was also a Crowded House, Cutting Crew, Mr. Mister. It, it's like uh, it, what they saved in dialect coaching for Mr. Sizemore, <laughs> they spent on the music budget. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're not going to see that drive. But Paulie's meeting with uh, Pete's lawyer, we can see this. And we'll tell you in advance, it doesn't go to plan. What's this? Pure generosity. My client has assured me he doesn't owe you a penny, but he's agreed to loan you $10,000. He's going to loan me $10,000. That sick bastard owes me thirty grand. $30,000. Do you understand me, you little prick? Your client is a gambling degenerate. He bets on his own sport. That's how sick he is. Please, Mr. Jansen, sit down. Okay. See, now, is that part truthful, Steve, that he's, he would short a guy like that? I, I believe so. I've done some ancillary reading yeah. on this subject. I thought I knew a lot about it, but I was surprised at how little I actually knew. Yeah. And part of that was... Uh, this, I'm not this surprised man's at how little you know, but <laughs> continue. <laughs> I was surprised at Paulie's existence because I wasn't exactly sure how um, Ed Pete took the fall. Yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a really bad way to go about all of this is right. to shortchange the guy that you're relying on uh, to keep your confidentiality and all. I don't know. And Pete's lawyer had no knowledge of any of this that Pete was up to, and uh, he really did believe he didn't know anybody any money. Yeah, but that also kind of sounds like didn't he? Did he really not know what was going well, on? Well, it, it's you know? his job not to know, but uh, yeah. he, he was apparently legitimately surprised yeah. during this meeting. And Polly was so angry. <clears throat> man, oh, man. Now, this is where the scene, uh, the film can be misleading if you don't know the real story. As, as best I understand it, Polly had already been sentenced for his steroid dealings. You know, something just occurred to me, Steve, and it's a day late and a dollar short per usual, but uh, I believe we could have gotten Pete Rose on the phone for this show had we just been willing to buy, like, two autographed jerseys. <laughs> and then we could, have, we could have hashed through all this and figured it all out, but I don't know. And I'm sure he would have been upfront and honest. Yeah. Uh. And probably not demeaning to either of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Paulie was looking at six months in prison for tax ad- Tax evasion. And the feds were only interested in Pete in initially because they suspected him of being involved in the steroid ring. You know, as an athlete and yeah. you know, being around other athletes, it would have made sense. Yeah, you can't. And, have- another way, Paulie is a moron. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> but he was not involved in that, and Paulie told them as much. He only threw Pete under the gambling bus with Major League Baseball after this uh, $10,000 loan was given him by uh, Pete's attorney. Yeah. So Paulie went to Sports Illustrated 
And it was strictly a vengeful act because Paulie felt betrayed by someone he considered a friend. So uh, let's take a look as he takes a polygraph. Did you ever sell drugs to Pete Rose? No. Did Pete Rose ever knowingly associate with people who sold illegal drugs? Yes. Was Pete Rose aware that you yourself had dealt illegal drugs? Yes. Did Pete Rose ever bet on the Cincinnati Reds baseball team? Yes. Did you yourself place bets for Pete Rose on Major League Baseball games? Yes. Yeah, so there is it, Sports Illustrated, as he goes to try to sell his story. They declined to uh, buy the story. Oh, really? Yeah. But they do go to press with the Rose allegations. Wow, they got a... Wow, really? Well, they do their own investigation. And oh, okay. Other yeah. witnesses spoke to the magazine as well. And that series of articles that followed led to Pete's troubles with baseball and the government. Now, that's a vindictive yeah. pal. Yeah. So Pete has a meeting with league executives to discuss the allegations. He denies betting on baseball. Here's the aftermath of that meeting. So long, Pete. What do you think? Well, like you said, he'd have to be insane. I believe him. I do too, actually. I don't disagree. But as long as you have these accusations with such gravity... Yeah, that article. It's going to create a certain climate. Right. Maybe it's time to bring in John Dowd. Do you think he's the right guy? We prosecuted the mom for the Justice Department. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, now you mentioned the Dowd report. Yeah. That is uh, eponymous with John Dowd. Okay. And he's an independent investigator, and he interviews everybody involved or alleged to be involved in the Pete Rose scandal. And practically everyone he talks to tells the same story. The only person who tells a different story is Pete Rose. Yeah. So You know, you know I said, like, oh, like, why would you hire a guy who's also dealing drugs to place your illegal bets for you? But now I see there is a certain genius to that because right before the scene we just saw, when he was talking to those commissioners, whatever they were, he says, like, look, these guys are just hangers on. They're drug dealers. They're trying to get money out of me. It, it, it provides a level of deniability for the whole thing. If you're, if you're hiring, like, an upstanding citizen to do these things for you, yes. then maybe you wouldn't have that. But it still seems like a misstep. But that was a contradictory element of Pete Rose's uh, stance then and now that all these people uh, were extorting him in some way. Yeah. But if there was nothing to extort you for, yeah. how could they? Yeah. Which kind of blew a hole in his, in his defense. Sure. <clears throat> so, yeah, John Dowd arrives. He talks to everybody. Uh, everybody tells the same story except for Pete. Um, and the story is that Pete not only bet on baseball, but he bet on the Reds to boot. As a result of the findings in what comes to be called, as you refer to it, as the Dowd Report, Pete is banned from baseball for life, a ban which, as we sit here in 2023, still stands. Yeah. So here, Pete faces the press following the announcement of his banishment. What are you going to do with yourself, Pete? Nothing. I'll have to do without baseball for the first time since I was seven years old. Pete. 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 Hey, you know, you know what they can't take away from me, from the fans? The bits and pieces of myself I left behind in all those ballparks for 27 years. Hey. They can't. Pete. They can't have. Pete, over, over here. If the and that's, that's very true, don't you agree? Well, there was a trash truck or something going by, so I didn't hear any of that. Okay, well, what he was happened? saying what they can't take away from me is all the pieces of myself I left on the field. Oh, sure. During my playing career. Well, they can take it away from you by not allowing you into the Hall of Fame, which has nothing to do with anything that we just saw. Right. They, they took away his ability to make a livelihood in baseball. Fair enough, I guess. I don't know. But why would you not allow this man to this day uh, what, 40 years after this happened, 20 years after this film was made, the guy's still not in the Hall of Fame because what? Well, because if you're banned from baseball for life, and I think this was a rule that took hold in the 80s at some point, not long before this occurred, Okay, that if you're banned from baseball, you're ineligible for Hall of Fame consideration. What? 
okay, now now that you're saying that, I do remember this. There was a commissioner who passed that rule, then died, like, right away. And he was the guy we saw who we should bring in doubt. I think that was uh, Bart Giamatti, yeah. Okay. Paul yeah. Giamatti's father. I don't know if that's true. That is true. The commissioner who banned Pete Rose for life is the father of Paul Giamatti. Okay. And he died, I think, a week or two after banning Pete. So he passed that rule for Pete, or he passed that rule, and then Pete was the first person to run a column? I think this was from the mid-'80s, and I think Pete was the first person to actually be affected by it. Yeah. But he undoubtedly, I mean, if you're talking about playing for Pete Rose, undoubtedly should be enshrined along the likes of Ty Cobb, Jackie Robinson, Lou Gehrig, Babe all, Ruth. All notorious assholes. Mike Piazza. Um. Scott Rowland. <laughs> really, people? <laughs> but, yeah, he may be a polarizing figure in the rest of the country, but in Cincinnati and Philadelphia, he's still beloved because of the way he played. He was a fans player and a guy who showed up every day to win. Yeah. And uh, people identified with that. And that's not forgotten. And despite his obvious myriad flaws, as a human being, it's hard not to view him as a sympathetic figure who lost the only thing he loved in life for a nonviolent, sober offense. So Pete ends up pleading guilty to tax evasion for unreported income from gambling winnings. Yeah. He served five months in prison. Yeah, five months in prison. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah, and three months in a halfway house. And, of course, the lifetime ban, which is um, unfair. Some say he doesn't help himself by endorsing a sports gambling app. But then again, in the intervening uh, decades since his exile, all major leagues are affiliated with sports gambling sites, which seems to be a bit um, hip- hypocritical. Yeah, not really, because you, you still can't use those sites if you're the manager of a team. If you're a player. Yeah, but I'm saying yeah. people criticized him for uh, endorsing a gambling app yeah. when the league themselves... When Major League Baseball does exactly that. Well, marijuana is legal in most of the country right now, and yet there's still people in jail who just bought a joint. Right. So, I mean, right. yeah. <clears throat> well, in 2004, Pete did admit to having bet on baseball while he was a player and manager. He has yet to admit to betting on his own team. Chris, anything you'd like to say before uh, we do the YouTube comment? No, I I didn't know that. He never admitted to betting on the Reds, huh? But they have enough evidence to know that he did. It's uh, unanimous in the testimony, yeah. Yeah. And regardless of maybe he never bet on them to lose, yeah, which would be far more damning, but you're still going to influence the game if you know, I got to I got to get this win, you know. You're going to you're going to change your bullpen strategy, you're going to change your pinch hitting strategy. Right. So. You you might uh lean harder on players who need rest. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> also, Chris, if he hadn't bet on the Reds, and he had just freely admitted to betting on baseball, the uh, punishment would have been a one-year suspension. Well, yeah, we saw in, the, in this movie that they kind of told him that's what it would be anyway. Um, and he kind of felt like he got hoodwinked there. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. Are we, what are we, are we waiting on Jim to pull something up? Is that what's going on? Uh, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, <laughs> we do have the YouTube comment, which, which I see is at the ready, unless there's anything more you want to say about the film. Uh, no, not. Well, we're going to rate it. We're going to rate it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's check out the YouTube comment uh, of the week. This is from Al R. Tom Sizemore showed great courage and dedication to his craft by wearing that tattered roadkill on his head. Mm. So that's also, that, that has nine thumbs ups. So. That's, that's not his real hair? No, no, uh, apparently not. I was, uh, do you remember, uh, we did a little skit here last week uh, called Spice Guys? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't think it's, any secret to anyone that I wear a wig when I do that? That's <laughs> right. it, right? <laughs> there was a guy, I was out at a bar last night, and there was a guy that I seriously thought he was wearing the same wig, but as, not as a joke, right. but hey, look at, my, look at my hair. I'm certainly not bald. And he had like sideburns that didn't match anything that was going on above sideburn level. And uh, I mean, he was, I mean, the thing is, if that is, somebody said, oh, no, this is real hair, but yeah. Come on, if that if that if that's how you walk around, like get a new hairstyle, right, 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 yeah, right, right. Everyone's right. looking at you like you're wearing a wig, but well, that might be the setup for the old joke. Yeah, it's his hair; he owns it. <laughs> <laughs> he paid for it. Yeah. <clears throat> he paid twelve dollars for it at Party City. <laughs> <laughs> it literally was that bad. <clears throat> you want to rate it, Chris? Um, you know what? I really like this, and. Uh, 
I, I, I would look forward to doing more of this type rather than, you know, some other things that we've seen a lot of. Yeah, so we can do that. I, I'm going to go, f- uh, well, is it four or five that's the top of our scale? I five. Forget. Five is the top of the scale. Uh, five Meredith Baxters. Then I'm going to go four and a half Meredith Baxters. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. It's a rarity. Well, I mean, it wasn't the greatest film in the world. I just enjoyed it a lot. I'm wearing a Philly sweatshirt. I'm a Phillies fan. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, whatever. Well, that's fair enough. I'm going two out of five Meredith Baxters. It works as a piece of entertainment. And despite its fictional elements, it's far more accurate than most movies of this type. Yeah. It loses its shine due to Tom Sizemore's choices as a performer, namely the choice to make no attempt at all to portray Pete Rose. Anything we didn't talk about, you might like to talk about. No, I'm good. Okay, in that case, I think we did it. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. Chris Morgani. I'm Steve Rizoski. Baby. Uh, Holy back at home. Tigers. Eat them raw. We did it. Yeah. <laughs>